Welcome to Creator Talks, the interview show with comic book writers and artists, authors and illustrators. I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. My guest on this show is Ken Christensen, a Los Angeles-based writer and producer. He is currently a writer for the Netflix TV series The Punisher and for sci-fi series Happy. Ken is also a lifelong reader of comics, and he has written comics, including Todd, the Ugliest Kid on Earth, just a name too, and now being published through Scout Comics, Oblivion. The first issue is already out, and the second is coming in October. So Ken and I talk about this sci-fi apocalyptic tale. Yes, you will see how things fall apart and how an 18-year-old virgin meets up with a group of juvenile detention center escapees to survive in a world turned upside down. Ken and I also talk about the comics he read growing up, his memories of working on the Superman Returns film back in 2006, and what advice he gives to those looking to be a scriptwriter, a comic book writer, in any line of work, what does he recommend in terms of education? Of course, we'll discuss the other creators on the book, their contributions, how they came together, and who created the logo for the book. And we talk about the poster that was on his bedroom wall growing up, the artist behind it, and how he eventually worked on that character. And we talk about Ken's beverage of choice. So let's begin my conversation with Ken Christensen on Oblivion. You're now on Creator Talks. And welcome to Creator Talks. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Let's start with comics. And let's start with your interesting comics. You are a lifelong comic book junkie. So what was the first comic book that you read? First comic book that I read had to be a Superman because my father was an obsessive a Superman fan. And he uh, had grown up with comic books and he had grown up uh, with the Superman TV show and the Batman TV show in the 50s and 60s. And I don't remember the specific issue, but I'm a thousand percent sure it had to be, you know, when I was probably two or three or four years old, he, he must have started buying Superman books for me. And, um, and so, of course, I promptly became a Batman fan. Did your dad manage to keep all of his comics as a kid or like most people of his generation – they were just thrown out. Yeah, they were thrown out. You know, when I became a comic book collector, which was in my kind of pre-teens, I was a real obsessive collector starting then. Like, you know, when I was 10 years old, I would read Comic Buyer's Guide cover to cover like a little nerd. Uh, and then I said, oh, Dad, can we go to Grandma's house? Because I want to look in her attic and see if all your comics are there. He said, there's no way they're there, but I'll take you and you can double check. So he took me there. And of course, the attic was empty. You know, I kind of chastised my grandmother for being so (laughs) short-sighted as to throw out my father's comic book collection. Now, other books you read, you went from Superman to Batman. What else did you read? Well, I think the Batman thing, you know, was like a rebellious move. I was like, oh, my dad loves Superman. I'm going to like Batman. He loves the guy with all the powers. I'm going to like the guy with no powers, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I'm also going to like the guy that I think I could become. When I became a Spider-Man fan, I, when I was a little kid, I tried to get spiders to bite me because I really thought like, oh, maybe that could work, you know? (laughs) Um, So I would capture spiders and I would put them, you know, in my hands and try to get them to bite me. Spider-Man was a huge one. And then as I got older, you know, I got into X-Men, Fantastic Four, Justice League. I mean, when I was a kid, Justice League International was Giffen DeMatteis' run was like, that was probably the book that I looked forward to the most, you know, during that whatever it was, three-year period that they were working on or a four-year period they were working on it together. That was the book that I thought nailed a totally new tone, a totally new vibe uh, that I'd never seen before. And, uh, And I loved it. You know, maybe you can see from some of the books that I write, I'm a comedy guy, but I also love writing action. And so the JLI run from that period was hugely influential on me. Yeah, that one's one of the definitive runs. Of all the books you read, do you connect with any of those books with the places where you read them at the time? Like for me, certain books will always stand out in my mind. I'll pick up that book out of my long box and go, 
Oh, I remember I was in my treehouse, or it was the last day of school, and I was out for the summer, and I read these books. Certain books just stick in my mind. Are there any for you that you have a special memory of? When I was a kid, I had a, not a comic book store, but a bookstore that sold old comic books. Like they had a section in the back that had a old comics. I would ride my bike there. I uh, must have taken, you know, must have been like a half hour, 40 minute bike ride just to get there. And uh, I would ride my bike there and spend whatever allowance money or whatever paper route money. I was a paper boy. Uh, you know, I would pick up these gems. So I remember, I remember that store vividly. I remember sitting in that store reading the Judas contract, the Teen Titan, New Teen Titans. And I remember, you know, a lot of the Teen Titans from that period, for whatever reason, really resonated with me. And, and that whole team and that whole Marv Wolfman, and George Perez run, I would find these gems. And I, I think that bookstore didn't know what they were worth either. So I also it also made an impression on me like, oh, my God, you know, these people are selling this book for a dollar. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I had the Overstreet Price Guide, like I knew what I was doing at a very young age, fifth grader. And uh, so, yeah, I remember those times. I remember those stores. I was also obsessed about cataloging everything. So I had a CD-ROM software program that you know, was specifically designed for comic book collectors. And I would dutifully, every month or month and a half, I would dutifully look at my pile of comics, whatever I had acquired that month and I would type them in. So I remember, you know, my bedroom spending hours typing in, cataloging each comic on the CD-ROM. So yeah, I mean, so many memories. And when I see the books today, like if I see a trade paperback of a book that I collected when I was a kid, I it does take me back to, uh, you know, that time and place. It's awesome. To me, it's part of the experience of reading the book is that memory. I mean, as I got older and I started buying tons of comics, they all blur together. But when you're young, it just brings back certain sights and smells and sounds. And the fun thing, too, back then was getting a hard copy. Now, today... Are you still a single copy print reader, digital, trade, or like me, all the above? I'm not a digital. I really love that digital gives more money to the creators. So that is a great thing. And I do uh, on occasion buy digital. And now that I work for Marvel for the last three years, Marvel gives me a complimentary digital account. So if I need to do some research uh, on the Punisher or something like that, I can go back into Marvel's catalog digitally, and hopefully it's one of the books available. They don't have everything available, so I do have to comb through my long boxes as well. So th those are the only, really the only times that I buy digitals when I really want to support a creator and give he or she as much money as possible. <laughs> uh, so like Brian K. Vaughn's amazing website, Panel Syndicate, I will buy stuff from there, even though I know in a year's time or whatever, the book may be out through Image because he's been doing that. But like Private Eye and Barriers and, and those kinds of books, I buy through Brian's website. But uh, for the most part, I, if I really want something, I'll buy the single issue if I love it. So, for example, I'm a big fan of The Sword, Alex and Ada. And so for those books, I was like, all right, I'm going to buy the single issues. And then when, when they came out you know, in trade, I bought the trade. If it comes out in a prestige hardcover, I'll buy that too. I want it on my bookshelf. So I don't spare any expense when it comes to <laughs> uh, books that I absolutely love and think are classics. So Saga is another one. Scalped, which is one of my favorite books of the last 25 years. You know, I have that. In fact, I kept forgetting which trades I'd bought because I was so far behind. So I'd be in a different city and I'd go to a comic book shop and I'd buy trade number six. And then I'd get home and I'd be like, oh, I have two copies of trade number six. Oh, well, you know, then I'd give it to somebody who hadn't read it. I've done that. I try to keep a list on my phone, especially when I go back issue hunting, because I'll go home and I'm like, oh, right. I already have it. Right. I was like, that looks so good, man. It's been a while since I've read it. I've done it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Now, before we get to your book, let's talk about your writing scripts, TV, film. You're a writer and producer of television shows and have worked in and on movie sets. What film or TV show gave you the desire to make a career as a scriptwriter? Uh, you know, I was a real TV junkie as well as being a comic book junkie. Most of the shows that I loved 
I mean, I was obsessed with the Batman, the animated series show, anything superhero related, as crappy as some of them were back in the day, you know, back in the 80s and 90s. I still loved them. I could overlook anything. And then when Batman, the animated series, which was a amazing show, came out, I was like, okay, this is what you can really do with superheroes on TV, right? Uh, this proves that you can really capture the essence of the original comics. So that was a big influence for me. But I loved the Wild Wild West, that reruns of the Wild Wild West. There was a period where I was like, is there any way I could build a time machine, go back, join the Secret Service in uh, 1866, uh, whenever that was supposed to take place? That show captured everything I thought TV could and should do. And then in the last 20 years, more contemporary shows. I'm a huge fan of Boardwalk Empire. I think that's one of the greatest shows ever made. Right now, there's actually a show that I think ranks among the best shows ever made that's on right now that nobody is watching, so I'm trying to promote it, and I have no stake in it. Uh, I don't even know anybody who works on it, but uh, Patriot, which is a espionage show on Amazon, I think is a Maybe one of the best shows ever made, like certainly in my top 10, maybe even in my top five best shows ever made. So watch Patriot, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't seen it yet. It's unlike any show you've ever seen. It's brilliantly directed, brilliantly written. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. Thank you for that recommendation to me and to the audience because my wife and I, we both watch Netflix and Amazon. Right now we're watching Ozark Season 2. Patriot sounds like it's right up our alley, so I'm going to let her know after our interview. That's one to put on the list. And everything you cited in terms of cartoons and TV shows, Batman Animated, Wild Wild West, Boardwalk Empire, watched them all. And yes, those are great examples, and I can see why that would inspire you so much to go down that path. Now, tying into comics, I'm just going to talk about or just ask you about just who, because you've done so much. You worked as location management on Superman Returns, and you also wrote an episode of Netflix's Punisher series, Virtue of the Vicious, Season 1, Episode 10. Any fond memories working on those two projects, either on or off the set? Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, I'm still working on Punisher. We've just completed Season 2. So all fond memories uh, from working on Punisher season one and two. But going back 10 years to Superman Returns, I was in graduate school. So I decided, OK, I want to be a screenwriter. I don't really know anything about screenwriting. Let me go to graduate school. And, I, and uh, I'm from New York and I was living in New York. So I said, all right, let me go to a New York school. So I applied and, and uh, thankfully got in to Columbia University's filmmaking program, MFA program. Got my MFA there, but I was trying to raise money to shoot my thesis film. Because when you're in graduate school, most of the time you need to pay for whatever movies you shoot, short films, you need to uh, pay for them yourself. The school doesn't give you much money or sometimes any money. And so I said, all right, let me get a job. And Superman Returns was shooting, most of the film was shot in Australia, but um, we did shoot in New York for a period of time. So I was the location manager in New York. I mean, let me tell you, that, that was at the time, and it may still hold the record for most expensive movie. I think the budget at that time was $240 million. Uh, so hugely, hugely expensive movie. And <laughs> by the time the movie got to New York, they had kind of run out of money, right? They were, it's the tail end of the production. And so I was tasked with getting these locations, for example, like the Daily Planet building. They knew what part of Manhattan they wanted to film in order to digitally put in the Daily Planet. And so I would have to get the rights from certain buildings to put cameras and scanners on the tops of these very important buildings around ground zero okay so it was where the, mm. where the where the world trade center used to be is where they wanted and and this was before the freedom tower was built so where the world trade center used to be ground zero was where they wanted the daily planet building all those buildings around that area are financial buildings so you would walk into like a Merrill Lynch and you'd say hey we'd like to you know put some cameras on the top of your building and of course Merrill Lynch multi 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 billion dollar company would say okay that'll be $150,000 for the afternoon you know stuff like that so 
I, being a very resourceful and very uh, scrappy location manager, you know, I would say, oh, yeah, that's great. No problem. And then I would leave and then I would take the camera crew and we'd come back without any permission at all. And we would uh, sneak our way into the building and onto a roof um, and do what we needed to do for free. And why I was doing this, you know, when this was a massive Warner Brothers, you know, most expensive movie of all time, why I was bending over backwards to get these kinds of shots for free, uh, I'm not quite sure. I think I was just scared that if I didn't come back with anything or if I told the production, oh, I can't get that building, they would fire me. So I just decided we'll do it like I would do it if I had no money and I was making my own movie. We'll just sneak in there and get the shot. So I did that on multiple occasions. We needed to be on a roof for like five hours one time. And I got the crew up there. And then somebody in the building, I think, had a kitchen fire. But we didn't know it was a kitchen fire. We thought the building was burning down. And we're on the roof and all of these fire trucks and ambulances and police cars pull up. And the firemen like make their way up the stairs and, you know, we need like 20 more minutes to get the shot. The firemen came up and I thought for sure I'm going to be kicked out of here for trespassing. And, you know, I just sweet talked the firemen because we looked authentic because we had all our equipment and everything. And so they looked at us and I think they thought, well, these guys, they've got to be legit. Like, look at all this equipment. You know, <laughs> they must belong here. So they look the other way. Anyway, I always laugh about some of those instances. There's even actually, if you have a second, there's another one that I love, which is we had to shoot the point of view Superman flying to Lois Lane's house. And we used the Hudson River, right? So we would from Battery Park across to New Jersey. So Lois Lane's house was actually on the other side of the Hudson River in New Jersey. And we used a helicopter. It was the only helicopter in New York that had a camera housing on the front of it. My job was to make sure that the mayor's office knew that we were going to be flying this helicopter repeatedly over the river in this one pattern to get Superman's point of view as he approached Lois Lane's house. I, of course, <clears throat> forgot to do that. I forgot to get the permission. So we're flying we're flying the helicopter across the river <laughs> repeatedly. And as the helicopter circles back around to Manhattan, we're flying by this luxury building. And the, uh, <laughs> and the police call the production office and they said, uh, first they called the helicopter company and they said, why are you flying this helicopter across the river in this pattern? It's very suspicious. Not only is it suspicious, but it's annoying because the chief of police lives on the penthouse of that building that you're flying next to, and he's trying to enjoy his Saturday afternoon, and you keep <laughs> buzzing you know, his patio, his like outdoor deck or something. And uh, the production office called me, and they said, hey, can you do us a favor and fax over – the mayor's office contract that says we're allowed to be flying in that pattern because the police are worried. And I was like, oh, my God, uh, I for <laughs> totally forgot to clear this with the mayor's office. So this was a Saturday afternoon. So I was like, all right. Again, I was like, let me bluff this. I go to my archives and I find some mayor's office contract from some other shoot. And they wanted it faxed, of course. They're not sophisticated enough at the NYPD to have email. So <laughs> I just white out all the old information. I put in all the old new information. <laughs> and, of course, it has the mayor's office signature at the bottom already from whatever job that was in the past. And I fax it through, and it was like, okay, no problem. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so very, uh, you know, very <laughs> scrappy, resourceful kind of guy in grad school trying to keep his job at the time i of course i was panicked but today i look back and i laugh about it <laughs> well i you know i was going to ask you besides a solid education from an accredited university like yourself columbia u now we know some uh, savvy and scrappiness and finding ways to get around things what else would you urge those who want to write for television and films to do all the things that I've just talked about, like you need to be persistent. You need never to give up, never take no for an answer. Right. And obviously I'm not advocating breaking the law <laughs> or forging the mayor's office signatures or anything like that. But I would say that it, it, you know, if you really look at it, you can tell that 
I was really driven to be in the business and felt like, okay, this is a, my path and I'm going to do everything I can to stay on the path. When I was out of undergrad, I wanted to be a comic book writer, okay? And I sent my resume to DC and Marvel and, and I was deterred. I actually got a call from an editor at DC Comics and he said to me, hey, I got your resume and, and uh, your writing samples or whatever I had sent him. And he said, I got to tell you, I don't think comic books are going to be around in 10 years. This is a dying business. Go into something else, which it's funny to look back on that now, because what I ended up going into uh, at the time was magazine publishing, which talk about a dying business. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, I lasted in that for about four or five years. And then I decided, OK, let, uh, I really don't want to be doing this as fun as it was. I, I was still determined to be a comic book writer and to get into TV. So I changed my course, decided I'm going to go all in. I'm going to go to grad school. That was another thing. I was like, I always advocate grad school for people who are thinking about something, but they're not really sure what they should do. It's like grad school is a commitment. I mean, you are giving up whatever job you have and you are saying, I'm going to spend an outrageous amount of money investing in doing the thing that I really want to do. And so a lot of people say, oh, you don't need to go to grad school. And, and they're right. But I think in terms of forcing yourself to commit all in, for me at least, that was the right decision. That's good advice. That's what my wife tells me because she went to grad school for um, biology, parasitology. And she said mm. it, it really makes a difference. It helps because she went and got her undergraduate. I think it was poultry science. <laughs> and she makes a mean chicken. But, <laughs> but she said that it really does help. It gives her an edge. And it does show. She said that you can get through it. You can stick to it and get through it. And she says that alone helps you in any job, whether you go into that field or not. Moving into comics, how do you approach writing comics differently from writing a TV script? What challenges do you face that you do not working on a TV script? Uh, well, one of the challenges that you face is partnership with uh, an artist, right? So if you don't have the right artist for your book, as brilliant as your writing might be, if the art doesn't match up, you really need the chemistry of the art and the and the words. When I was a kid, I loved great artwork, right? I was a big fan of different artists. And if there was a writer artist who I loved the artwork for and their writing wasn't that great, I wouldn't necessarily buy the book. But if, if it was a writer artist who was just as good at, at writing as they were uh, at their art, then I you know, I always bought the book. So I always kind of prioritize the writing. I've kind of taken that forward. Like I need to make sure that the artist on a book that I'm doing matches up to the story. And that, that could be a style thing. If it's an action book, you want somebody who knows action. They might have a great style, but they don't know how to do action really well. Uh, and I got really lucky with my first book, uh, which was Todd, the Ugliest Kid on Earth, uh, which was published by Image Comics. That series uh, was co-created and drawn by M.K. Perker, and M.K. you might know from his Vertigo series Air, which ran for about three years. He did another Vertigo book called Cairo, an original graphic novel, and Todd the Ugliest Kid on Earth, which you know, is probably the thing that people know most from him. So I got really lucky. He'd never done American comics before. He was living in New York. He was doing my... <laughs> This is another grad school story. I was sitting at a cafe writing scripts and a, the cafe manager came over to me and said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm in grad school. You know, I really want to be a, a filmmaker and a comic book writer. And she said, oh, my husband is an artist. And I thought, oh, that's cute. <laughs> uh, aspiring artist. And she said, you should meet with him. I said, all right. So I had coffee with him one day and he brought his portfolio, which was all illustrations from like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, all these massive publications. And I was looking at him like, you want to work with me? What are you crazy? Uh, I'm a nobody, you know, but for some reason he liked me and he, we got, you know, our tastes were the same. And uh, so he started doing my grad school storyboards for the scripts I was writing for my little short films. And after a few months, I said, let's come up with a comic book pitch and go to um, San Diego Comic-Con. And, you know, I don't know anybody there, but like, let's just walk around and meet publishers. 
And so that's what we did. And that led to some relationships, got us our first job, and then, you know, eventually gave us a career. And now here you are working on Oblivion through Scout Comics. The first issue came out last week of August, I believe. Yeah, it was slated to come out last week, but they got it out early somehow. I never heard of that. Usually, <laughs> usually <late>. comic book companies, <laughs> yeah, come out. You know, they overpromise and and, uh, and then they can't deliver. In Scout Comics case, you know, they delivered a week early, which is good. So yeah, it's in stores now, Oblivion, and you can request it obviously uh, from your retailer now if they can get it from the distributor if they don't have any copies, or you can buy it directly from Scout Comics' website. I know they have some inventory left, but I have heard from some retailers that it is sold out at the distributor level. I'm not sure um, if that's still true, but I think that was true last week. The numbers are good, and it's doing well. In a way, that's a good sign for you that it's sold so well, but uh, we don't want readers to be sad, so (laughs) they can always go through Scout. (laughs) Yes, you can always go through scoutcomics.com. Pick it up. Okay, I'm actually just checking my email while we talk, and my editor, publisher of Scout Comics, just emailed me and said it's actually going to be out October 3rd. Issue number two, October 3rd, is the in-store date. Okay. So there you go. That's up to the minute. We're, we're like live, up to the minute uh, <laughs> broadcast of the release date for Oblivion number two. Yeah, so Oblivion is a book that I've been wanting to write for a long time. I carved some time out of my busy schedule and got the artist that I thought was perfect for it, Francesco Gaston. He's an Italian artist uh, who has done work for Marvel and Image, and uh, he and I are working really, really well together. We're working on issue number six right now, and it's a post-apocalyptic story, but it's I I like to call it an apocalyptic story, actually, because uh, you actually go through the apocalypse. That's one of the things that I kind of always felt was missing from a lot of my favorite post-apocalyptic stories. You know, The Walking Dead is a great example. It's like you never actually see uh, in the original Walking Dead comic what happened. It starts pre-zombie virus, and then Rick goes into a coma and wakes up you know, after the virus has taken hold. So it's always been an area that I wanted to play with was like, okay, what would really happen? And this is not a zombie story, so don't get me wrong. It's not a zombie story. It's something else going on, but it is a massive disruption of the world. And we see the world crumble in a way, but it crumbles slowly. And that's kind of what I like about it is things start to fall apart. And as they fall apart, I'm trying to handle these characters as realistically as possible, you know, putting myself in their situation. What would I do if this part of the world started to fall apart? And then that part of the world started to fall apart. How would I use my resourcefulness and whatever I had at my disposal to handle what needed to be handled? And the key players in the first issue, one is a virgin and these juvies in detention hall, and they're all going to somehow come together in this survivalist story. You wrote this story for you. This is your story. This is your creation. This is what you want to write. You've said it's not for everyone, and that's fine. And please explain why that's okay with you. Yeah, I mean, I always feel like if you're writing something and everyone thinks it's great, everyone loves it then something's wrong with that, right? Because we're not all predisposed to love everything. I think you're not, as a writer, you're probably not pushing your story far enough if everybody's a fan of it. That, to me, is a kind of milk toasty. uh, That's a sign that whatever you've created is probably kind of milk toasty, if Mm -hmm. I can use that word. It's like, hmm... You know, you're trying to appeal to everyone. To me, that's boring. What's fun is write what you want to write. Don't worry about everybody else's opinion. You know, I've challenged myself uh, in my career to write what I would be entertained by and push it as far as I can. Uh, You know how you do a yearbook quote when you're in high school? Mm Mm-hmm. My yearbook quote was, and keep in mind, you probably write these quotes when you're 17 years old, right? My yearbook quote was a quote from Pablo Picasso, and it was, the chief enemy of creativity is good taste. Even as a teenager, I was like, 
don't worry about quote unquote good taste, what people think is tasteful. Like that is the death uh, of art. Trying to approach this as what is realistic? What would a reasonable human being do? In this case, right, one of our lead characters is a 17 year old girl, a virgin, who thinks she should be independent from her parents. And over the course of issue one, she gets what she wants, but not the way she expects. One of her tasks, as you alluded to, is her brother, who's 15, is in a juvenile detention center. What would you do if your brother, who you don't like, was in a juvenile detention center and the world started to fall apart and you realized, oh my God, he can't get out of there. This is a lockup for teenagers and all these kids are going to starve to death in this juvie hall. Uh, you know, what would you do? And that's the basic premise of issue one. That's one of her several challenges. I say it's a mature audience's book. So even though some of the main characters are kids, it's not a book that's necessarily for kids. It's written by an adult for adults. It's the book that I would love to read. And probably if I was 16, I would want to read it. I would say, oh, mature audience's book. Awesome. I'm ready for that. But again, it has a mature audience's label and people should know that going in. When I did Todd the Ugliest Kid on Earth, it was the same thing. It was like people saw this cute kid character and, you know, Todd is in elementary school. He's a little kid. And I used to say, don't let the cute protagonist fool you. This is not a book for your 10-year-old kid. Uh, this is not Bart Simpson. You know, if you let your kid watch South Park, then maybe this is a book for your kid. But if you don't, just because it has a cute title and a cute protagonist, this is still a mature or at least a teen plus book. So Oblivion is the same way. And the characters in Oblivion, you're definitely putting him to the test, getting him into some very tough situations, handling it the way they would handle it. And I know I'm being a little vague, so I don't want to give stuff away, but one of the fun things about reading it is that it doesn't go where I expect. You know, some very shocking things happen, and you let those things happen because it's your book and you can do what you want with it, which is great because it's not like, oh, that was predictable. I kind of expected to go down this path or that path. There's some really big surprises in the first issue, so that's the fun thing about it. I appreciate you saying that. I felt the same way when I wrote the script. I said, oh, this is taking a turn that I didn't expect. You know, sometimes that happens when you're writing as you're going down a path and then all of a sudden, wham, inspiration hits you or an idea hits you and you go, oh, I'm going to take it there. And luckily with a publisher like Scout Comics, you have the license to take it there. I'm sure if this was uh, a Marvel book, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that you recognize that and that it surprised you. And I, I think uh, most people who read it are thrilled by those surprises. And those people who aren't thrilled <laughs> are the people that don't appreciate it and uh, shouldn't pick up the next issue. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I said, it's an edgy book and uh, not everybody can handle that kind of edge. So you talked about Francesco and the art is excellent and he's paired with colorist Jen Hickman. Did you have any say in who you picked as a colorist or was that something Francesco had mentioned or how did that all come together? I actually found Jen who had recently graduated from art school and uh, she has gone on to be a penciler inker and she's a creator of her own books as well but i'm a big fan of finding people who are coming out of art school who are rock stars uh, in their field we also for issue one also has a variant cover by Ariella Christentina, who also came out of art school, a same school, Savannah College of Art and Design, with Jen, their friends. And so I got them on board, and uh, Ariella, who has gone on to do uh, a Wolverine for Marvel, I think she did a miniseries for Boom, and now she's doing a Dark Horse book. So she's gone on to do great things also. So I paired them up, paired up Francesco and Jen, and they were off to the races, and they're doing great work. And I want to also mention those who are often forgotten, the letterer. They're often unsung. So let's sing of Ali Schwed. Now, she too is an illustrator and cartoonist, not just a letterer. Did you also have some involvement in getting her on board? I totally did. So she is also a graduate of Savannah College of Art and Design and a friend 
uh, of Ariella's and a friend of Jen. So Ali has done work for me in the past. I did a book for IDW called Indestructible, which is a superhero uh, satire. And Allie was my letterer on that book. She's an incredible letterer. And um, I had a book come out earlier this year called Fairy Godbrothers through Adaptive Books. And she was a letterer on Fairy Godbrothers as well. So I hope to work with Allie the rest of our careers. I really liked how you put everyone together because sometimes I'll talk to someone who's working for a larger company, big two, not doing their own thing. And I'll say, oh, and what can you tell them about the letter? And they're like, I don't really know them. And it's not their fault. They were assigned to them. But it's nice to know that you handpicked each person working on this book. And they're very artistic people. Down to the letter where they actually draw and write their own stuff. So that's going to really, I think, have a very positive and influential effect on the book overall. What's amazing about uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, they have a lettering major. So she, Allie, was actually a lettering major or well, it was grad school, so it, I guess it wouldn't be a major, but a lettering concentration. So that's what she focused on in grad school. You can't really do any better than that. Like somebody who said, I want to focus on this particular aspect of comics to the point where I'm going to spend tens of thousands of dollars being trained <laughs> in the art of lettering at a graduate school. Don't think there's too many professional letterers out there who got their MFA in lettering from a one of the best art schools in the country. I have one more question about the book, Oblivion. Who made the logo for that? I'm so glad you asked. It's uh, another Italian artist, Paolo Altieri. I'm butchering his name, but he has done logos for me uh, in the past, and I love his work, and he is a comic book artist as well as a graphic designer, and I, again, love, adore his work, and I hope to uh, work with him on well, I have already worked with him on another book, which will come out next year called Firewater, and he did an incredible logo for Firewater. Unless I'm misreading this, there's an eight in that logo? There's a one and an eight. So Oblivion, and if you're going on a comic book website and you're, you know, retailing website and you're like, huh, I don't see anything called Oblivion, some comic book websites will spell the book the way the logo looks. So then you have to type in O-B-L-I-V-1-8-N, which is how the logo is designed. It's pronounced Oblivion, but the logo incorporates a 1 and an 8 into the I and the O at the end of the word. And the significance is? Well, and the significance, that's kind of a spoiler, so I don't want to get too deep into it. But the significance has to do with a revelation in the book in issue number six. Very good. Something to look forward to and discover. That's right. Now I have fun questions to ask all my guests. You're very busy. You do a lot of work. When you have the chance, what do you like to do for rest and relaxation? I'm a huge cinema file, so I, I love going to the movies. I live in Los Angeles. Quentin Tarantino owns a movie theater about five blocks from my house, and it's double features Every day, seven days a week, seven bucks for a double feature. Wow. And we're talking about from Quentin's own 35 millimeter print collection. I'll go and I'll do a double feature. And then on Saturdays, not only do they do the double feature at night, but they do kids' movies during matinees. So they'll do it like a double feature live action Disney movies from 1965. You know, those kinds of things. And I'll project it on 35 millimeter. I'm as obsessed with film and TV and comics as any fan to quote unquote rest and relax. I'll go to the movies or I'll go to the comic book store and I'll, you know, so I'm, that's the kind of rest and relaxation. I also have a two year old. So yesterday, you know, it was a holiday. It was Labor Day. Didn't go into the office, hung out with my kid. Got some things done, went to the store, went to the park, you know, just had fun and uh, went to a party, went swimming. Like, so I'll hang out with my kid and my wife and try to have a, as relaxing a time as possible. Although when you are a freelance writer, which all TV writers are, you're constantly thinking about whatever script you're supposed to be writing for whatever TV show. So I, 
I just spent the last six months in New York writing the Grant Morrison TV show Happy based on the Image comic. And when uh, my wife and kid would come visit me because I was there full time uh, in New York for six months, which is tough when you have a two year old. You know, we would take advantage of New York. You know, we would go out, go to the park, we would go to the zoo, you know, all those kinds of things and try to escape the writer brain of, oh, I must be thinking about, you know, new pitches for episode six of Happy Season 2, you know, that kind of thing. Because you can overwhelm yourself with bringing your work home all the time. Oh, yes. Well, to take your mind off of work, think back to a birthday of yours that stands out. It was your favorite birthday. What was it about that birthday that was your favorite? When I was like five years old, I'd say, oh, man, I love being three. I mean, three was the best year, <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't think anything's going to get better than age three. I'm not sure why, but I remember my third birthday as being like magical. Uh, I know my mother, she is a, a very good cook. And I remember that she made a train cake. So it was like eight cakes, all different train cars. And then, of course, had all my cousins and my friends from you know preschool or the friends from the neighborhood come over. And for whatever reason, I just remember that train cake. It was as long as the dining room table, this cake, you know. And it was kind of magical. I remember that train cake. I remember all my friends being there and being so, imp- you know, everybody was being so impressed with that cake and just having the best time. But I remember probably my whole elementary school, I would look back and go, God, it sucks to get old, you know. I remember back when I was three, when life was good. <laughs> that is the earliest birthday memory anyone's ever shared with me on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also, I also lost my virginity on my 16th birthday, so that's another great birthday. <laughs> <laughs> well, totally true. <laughs> won't go there. We'll go somewhere in between three and 16 when you were a teenager. In your room, in your bedroom, what posters and pictures did you have on the wall? Well, I have an amazing answer for that because my mother thought I was going to turn out to be like a trench coat mafia, you know, Columbine massacre kid because I had a huge Mike Zek Punisher poster on my wall. (laughs) And, you know, there's the Punisher machine gunning off screen, you know, countless bad guys. And it was a huge poster. It wasn't just like a pinup out of the back of a comic book. It was like some giant poster that I found at some Comic-Con because I was going to Comic-Cons when I was a kid too. And my mother was, to her credit, she let me put it up and did not demand that I take it down. But yeah, I mean, the Mike Zek Punisher poster. And a couple of years ago, I was a guest at the Silicon Valley Comic-Con and they put us on a bus, all the kind of guests of the Comic-Con, and they took us to a winery, and I'm sitting in the back of the bus next to some guy, and we struck up a conversation, and he said, yeah, you know, I'm an artist. I said, well, what's your name? He said, Mike Zek. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. This is, and this is before I got on Punisher season one, before I got that job. So, you know, I said, oh, my God, I grew up with that. And I told him the whole story about my mom. Uh, you know, because years later, she was like, oh, God, when you had that poster on your wall all through seventh and eighth grade, I thought this kid is bound for disaster. And, you know, when I got the Punisher job, I called my mother and I said, remember that poster, of the guy with the <laughs> skull on his chest? And she said, yes. I said, that's going to be paying my rent for the next five years or whatever. She was like, oh, OK, oh, amazing. Uh, So, yeah, that would be the answer to that. Okay. What were you listening to at the time, music-wise? It was a kind of grunge era. So a lot of Nirvana, Guns N' Roses, Pearl Jam, uh, Smashing Pumpkins, you know, all that kind of stuff. Hypothetical question. You're stuck on a deserted island, and you're going to get off. You'll be fine, but you don't know when. So... You can take one book with you. You're going to have one book with you that you like to read. It's your Desert Island book. What would that one book be? Comic book or any book? Oh, it could be either. It could be book, comic book, graphic novel, trade paperback, whatever you want. All right. I I can only bring one, huh? Well, if it's a set, if it's part of a series, 
You can take the series. I'll, I'll allow that. Mm, you'll allow that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of other guests. It's so hard. It could be like a Fantastic Four omnibus or something. Right. God. Oh, man. You know, I do have to say that I do have to say that Catch-22 is probably my favorite book. It's endlessly entertaining. It's so endlessly entertaining and so complex, so funny, that every time I read it, it surprises me. And that's one of the things that I love about it. I would say that. And if you let me have... Uh, comic book to go along on that desert island reading catch 22 and having a great time and a box washed up an amazon package washed <laughs> up on shore from some fedex or ups plane that crashed in the ocean uh, i would hope that in that uh, box would be the claremont burn run of the x-men both very good choices because well like you said if it's something you can get something new out of each time you read it that's what you want if you're going to be stuck on an island. You can pick something you've never read before, but if you don't like it, you're stuck with it for a while. So something you can read again and again. Yes. And yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> now, when you're taking some time off, you're resting, relaxing, you're kicking back, what is your beverage of choice? I mean, this is going to sound a little bit douchey because it's trendy. Or I think it's trendy anyway, but I love tequila and i love casamigos tequila casamigos is the george clooney tequila that's why i think it's douchey because it's george clooney's tequila um <laughs> but it's so delicious and i know there's better tequila out there but i'm talking about tequila that is reasonably affordable so my wife sent me to the store the other day you know to buy something she said buy a rosé and you know and then buy whatever you want to buy went to the store i found my casamigos george clooney tequila i picked up a bottle then i'm wandering around the rosé section of, uh, this is at whole foods i'm wandering around the rosé section and i see this cool looking bottle of rosé I, I i feel like oh i've seen that before it's reasonably priced but not too reasonable i'll take that because she didn't give me a brand that she wanted so i grabbed that bottle of rosé i take it home she goes, what are you doing, Ocean's Eleven? I go, what do you mean? She goes, that rosé that you bought is from a winery owned by Brad Pitt. And, <laughs> and you bought the George Clooney tequila and the Brad Pitt rosé. I was like, I didn't even know Brad Pitt owned a winery. <laughs> it's French. What's he doing over there in France? So anyway, the Ocean's Eleven uh, alcohol purchase. Well, it seemed pretty goofy at the time. But I got to be honest, that Casamigos tequila, if you haven't tried it, oh, my God, it's great. Okay. On the rocks. I'll give yeah. it a shot. Final question. What is the one question that someone has not asked you in an interview? Something you want people to know about you. So what is that one question? Mm, you know, no one has ever asked me how many keys in a piano. <laughs> no one. No one's ever asked me that. I can't imagine why. <laughs> no one's ever. I mean, I know the answer. and No one's ever asked. And I always want to say 88. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, I want someone to ask me that question so I can bust out with the answer and then blow their minds. <laughs> Ken Christensen, living the dream. My guest today on Creator Talks, Oblivion, issue number two. We have confirmation. It's coming out October 3rd. Get your orders in and hurry because it's selling like hotcakes. Yes. Please, retailers, get your orders in. Readers, get out there. Tell your retailers oblivion please get the oblivion you won't be disappointed and i'm at ken christensen on twitter if you are disappointed i want you to tweet me please tell me why or if you love it feel free to reach out to me on twitter or facebook uh, or instagram at ken christensen k-e-n-k-r-i-s-t-e-n-s-e-n -E -E and i will put that in the show notes ken thank you so much for being on creator talks thank you chris and coming up next Thursday, Chelsea Kane, the author of Maneaters, being published through Image Comics, and it's out September 26th. Now, Chelsea also worked on the series Mockingbird for Marvel Comics, and she's back with this new series through Image, but she's also coming back to Marvel on a new Vision miniseries, picking up where Tom King left off. So we will talk about both those books, her writing, and a whole lot more. 
You do not want to miss this one, so please subscribe through iTunes. The podcast is free. Don't miss a single one. It is out every Thursday, and it is available on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, YouTube, Amazon-enabled devices, and now on Pocket Casts. Pocket Casts was acquired by NPR earlier this year and other public radio stations and This American Life. And so now my show is distributed on that platform as well. And if you like what you hear, please rate and review the show on iTunes. Even leaving just a star rating goes a long way to help the show stand out. Also, spread the word. Tell a friend about this on-demand interview podcast. For Creator Talks, I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. Thanks for listening. Until next time.